Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Murase, Executive Director of the Department on the Status of Women. I'm here to welcome you this morning. Thank you for joining us. We are co-sponsoring this important educational event with the San Francisco Office of Labor Standards Enforcement and the Chamber of Commerce. So I really want to thank all the co-sponsors, panelists, and attendees for participating in this session and for your commitment to ensuring the successful implementation of this new ordinance. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our first panelist, President of the Board of Supervisors, David Chu. He was elected in November 2008 to represent San Francisco's District 3. Anybody here from District 3, Supervisor Chu's neighborhood? All right, one in the back. Since January 2009, he served as president. Before joining the board, President Chu was founder and COO of Grassroots Enterprise, an online communications technology company. Prior to Grassroots, he worked as a criminal prosecutor in the San Francisco District Attorney's Office and as a civil rights attorney at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Before taking office, he was really a hands-on leader in San Francisco as a small business commissioner, chair of Lower Polk Neighbors, board president of the Youth Leadership Institute, board chair of the Chinatown Community Development Center, judge arbiter for the Polk Street Community Court, and president of the Asian American Bar Association of the Greater Bay Area. He was previously elected to the Democratic County Central Committee and chaired the 13th Assembly District. And we know David because for many, many years he served on the board of Partners to End Domestic Abuse. And he has been at the forefront of uh, prevention and education strategies on violence against women. Please help me welcome President Chu. Thank you, Emily. And uh, I am so excited that all of you are here today to talk about how we implement our family-friendly workplace ordinance. I particularly want to thank our departments who are here, OLSE, the Department of the Status of Women, uh, our labor agencies, uh, and those of you that worked with my staff uh, to get this done. Let me first start by saying that uh, seven months ago when we proposed this idea, I did not realize uh, the intensity of the reaction that we were going to get. And uh, I had a lot of friends in the business community who uh, said, David, what are your motives for why you're moving this legislation forward? And as I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, I'm going to start with the following. At the time when I introduced this, it was not yet public uh, that just a month ago I put a ring on my finger. I got married, uh, and when I had introduced the legislation, I had just gotten engaged. Uh, and as for those of you who are married, for those of you who have families in San Francisco, foremost on your minds is the challenges that our city is facing when it comes to how we raise children. Uh, the fact of the matter is, since the last census, we have lost literally hundreds of young families uh, who have been unable to figure out how to balance their work obligations with their family obligations. Now, about nine months ago, my fiance at that time, she asked me to read a book uh, written by a college classmate of mine who happens to be a very prominent business leader in our country, Sheryl Sandberg. She wrote a book called Lean In. Uh, for those of you who have read this book, you know in part it is about how it is uh, that we can move women uh, to the top of businesses and corporations in our country. But part of that book was also about the importance of policymakers, and if I may be blunt, the importance of male policymakers really stepping up to help us think about how our workplaces uh, can help our families, can help women advance in the workplace. And so uh, I started thinking about this topic earlier this year of what could we do to make San Francisco more family friendly? What can we do to make our workplaces uh, better for folks that are juggling the obligations of kids uh, and parents who may be ailing, partners who may be sick? And uh, I want to take a moment and acknowledge my aide, Catherine Rauschheber, who is in the back, uh, who did a lot of heavy lifting on this legislation and who will be with you uh, this morning. Um, I asked her to look around the country and look around the world to find interesting policies that we could propose in San Francisco to address this. She found a policy that was first proposed in 2007 
by three United States senators whose name you probably recognize. The first was someone who, until he passed away recently, was a lion for labor and working families in the U.S. Senate, Senator Ted Kennedy. And there were two other individuals who joined him in the very proposal that we're talking about now. You may recognize the name Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Senators Kennedy, Obama, and Clinton proposed a national right to request workplace flexibility. In fact, the very idea that we were able to legislate a couple months ago here in San Francisco. Now, they proposed this in Washington, D.C., uh, because it had been an idea that had worked incredibly successfully with employers and employees around the world. Uh, probably about 10 years before that, in England, in Ireland, in Australia, in New Zealand, employers and employees, after national legislators had implemented right to request countries, um, they had had an extremely positive experience with the idea that we're talking about today. Uh, for employees, the benefits are obvious. When you create a safe space for an individual worker to ask for the possibility of a 21st century work situation, whether it be asking for flexibility in hours, asking for uh, part-time work, telecommuting, flex time, employees, as you can imagine, uh, find that to be a benefit. The less counterintuitive thing, though, has been the very positive experience for employers. And as I know uh, our fellow panelists will talk about, what managers, what CEOs have found is that when you implement family-friendly workplace environments, your workers are much happier. Your workers are less likely to leave you. You're less likely to call an absent. They're less likely to turn over. And what that has meant for the U.S. economy has been literally billions of dollars of increased productivity uh, and billions of dollars that otherwise would be spent on absenteeism and turnover. And I can tell you from my own experience as someone who ran a tech company here in San Francisco, we were faced with this situation some 11, 12 years ago, a few years after I started our business. We had a lot of young 20, 30-something employees. They started asking me, hey, uh, just had a kid, just had my second kid. Do you mind if I start Working, come in at 11, p, 11 a.m., and do you mind if I finish up my work at 2 in the morning? And we were faced with the question, well, do we want to allow this? And we made the decision to do it, and it was based on a hunch that happy employees meant more productive employees. And I can tell you, uh, the most productive employees that we have had at the company that I ran were folks that had kids but had the flexibility to come in and out of a job knowing that there were still very high expectations that they were going to have to deliver the code that we had asked them to uh, program, uh, the marketing materials that we needed of them by 9 o'clock the next day, uh, etc. So fast forward. Um, about eight or nine months ago, we were having a conversation with local and national advocates for working families about what to propose here. And what we decided to do in June of this year was to propose a work, uh, the, the very ordinance that we're talking about today, our Family uh, Friendly Workplace Ordinance. Now, this legislation, as you may know, did uh, get a lot of feedback, and there were a lot of concerns that were raised by the business community for the initial drafts of what we're talking about. And frankly, the initial drafts, we included essentially a kitchen sink of different uh, policy options and legislative uh, requirements, uh, some of which uh, we have significantly tinkered with to really make sure that what we're talking about works well within the business climate that we have uh, here in our country, in our state, and here in San Francisco. And I very much want to thank those of you from the business community, including the Chamber of Commerce, uh, including many advocates for small businesses and large businesses that gave us significant feedback in how to tweak this legislation so it works both for workers as well as uh, for managers. And let me just close by saying uh, the following, which is since we have introduced this legislation, uh, my office has received many calls from jurisdictions around the country interested in moving this forward. I should also mention that there is one state that has already beaten the state of California to the punch. The state of Vermont has actually implemented similar legislation to this, and it is my hope that what Vermont and San Francisco are doing will be a model in how we move this around the country. But at the end of the day, Part of what we are reacting to with this legislation is the fact that the demographics of who works 
has been changing significantly. It used to be when I was a kid growing up in the 1970s, the typical family was a beaver cleaver family where you had a breadwinning father who worked round the clock, and you had his wife at home who worked equally hard but was taking care of the kids and taking care of other family members. Now, over the last 35, 40 years, that has changed dramatically. It used to be that Beaver Cleaver model represented over half of all families. Today, because of divorce rates, because of single-family households, because of the fact that most households involving two parents involve also two parents at work, that Beaver Cleaver model is now only one out of five families. So thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to the further conversations. Thank you so much. My name is Amy Allison. I'm a Director of Media and Community Affairs at the Department on the Status of Women, and I am very pleased to be your MC for uh, the remainder of the event. Uh, I'll be moderating this panel and then the question and answer. So I want to remind you that the cards in front of you, you can write your questions when they come up, and then you want, we have staff people around that will be watching for those cards and we'll pick them up from you. I want to introduce our very first panelist, my colleague Ann Lehman. She's Women's Human Rights Specialist with the San Francisco Department on the Status of Women. And over the past two decades, Ms. Lehman has developed innovative initiatives, most notably the award-winning local implementation of the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. I might add she has done so much to support the implementation of the Family Friendly Workplace um, Initiative along with our colleagues. Good morning, um, and thank you, President Chu, for your um, policy initiative. This is really, really exciting. In 2000, we did a study um, on policies then in practice. And while there weren't a lot of policies being used, those that were turned out to be incredibly effective. Um, as you can see here, um, these are all, the, if you can't read these percentages, um, reduced absences for those who were, um, had flexible schedules is 65%. Reduced turnover, 55%. Re in chance recruiting, 50% and on and on and on. Um, the only negatives that were found at that time were obviously scheduling was a little bit more difficult, um, but surprisingly only 6% of departments felt that there was an abuse concern. Um, so really the, the, the big fear that many had that, and, and there was a huge fear. When we did this study, I cannot tell you the amount of resistance we received. At that time, this was pre-9-11, um, the, the city had a very rigid 8-5 to five schedule, and the idea that you would let employees out of your sight um, and out of your control was fearsome. But in fact, it turned out not to really be an issue for those that were actually doing it. Um, as was mentioned by President Chu, a number of other countries have adopted similar programs. All of these countries have programs that are somewhat similar to this, and five of them in particular adopted this work right to ask for request flexibility. Um, a study was done in England on this exact statute, and what they found after just a few years was that it had a broadly positive impact, that most of the requests that were asked for were granted, the cost was really not an issue, that only a very few were appealed, and when they were appealed, they were appealed primarily because the supervisor said no without even thinking about it, um, just as a blanket, like, no, that's not happening. Um, and that really, it encouraged both workers and employers to come up with new ways to thinking about flexibility. Thank you, and um, we'll have more time to talk. Um, during the break, or during the questions. Thank you. Okay, San Francisco's not the only one. Uh, and I'm excited to hear much more detail. Our next panelist is Donna Levitt. And uh, let me tell you a bit about her, um, although everybody does have these bio sheets and you can follow along. She's brought over 20 years of experience in the construction industry, 
to the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement uh, when she was hired to lead the office in 2002. She's among a group of pioneering tradeswomen um, when she began her carpenter apprenticeship in 1980, and she's worked in the trades uh, for over 10 years as a carpenter, superintendent, and estimator. Ms. Levitt's also widely respected as a union representative and the only woman to head a major construction local in the United Brotherhood and sisterhood of carpenters and joiners in America. Very excited to hear more detail about the family-friendly workplace ordinance from Don Levitt. Thank you. Good morning. In my presentation, I will review the provisions of the Family Friendly Workforce Ordinance in some detail and explain what employers need to know in order to comply. The FFWO is codified in the San Francisco Administrative Code as Chapter 12Z and will become effective on January 1, 2014. The high points of the ordinance include that it allows employees to request flexible or predictable working arrangements. It prohibits adverse employment actions based on caregiver status. It prohibits retaliation and interference with employees' rights. It requires employers to post a notice where employees will see it. It requires employers to maintain records. It authorizes the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement, that's OLSE, uh, to review compliance and enforce the law. And it authorizes a collective bargaining waiver. There are some parts of the law that will get further clarified in a rulemaking process. And starting from the top, who is a covered employer? The law says that an employer uh, who is a business or a person who employ, regularly employs 20 or more employees is covered by this law. Um, I think that's going to need further clarification. And um, it would be the goal of our office to bring the covered employer definition into conformity uh, with the health care security ordinance to the greatest extent possible. I'm guessing that a number of you are familiar with that law. Can I see? Yeah, OK. Um, so businesses that are covered by the health care security ordinance are those who have 20 or more employees anywhere. So a business could have um, 50 employees in New York City or in Sydney, Australia, but have five in San Francisco. And those five would be covered by the Family Friendly Workforce Ordinance, if we were to interpret this the same way we do with the HCSO. Um, in the cases where there's a fluctuating workforce, there will be some kind of a look back period, maybe a year, maybe six months, uh, where we would take an average of the number of employees. So I would advise employers to keep that in mind as you're planning for enforcement of this ordinance. Employees are covered if they've been employed by the employer for six months or more, or they regular, and they regularly work at least eight hours per week in San Francisco. Again, uh, if, to further clarify, in those cases of employees, part-time employees who fluctuate in the number of hours per week, we'd be thinking about a look-back period probably of six months and an average number of hours worked per week. Employees covered by the ordinance have the right to request, and that's key, a flexible or predictable working arrangement. I heard Supervisor Chu in um, discussions at the Board of Supervisors describe the intent of the ordinance in a way that made sense to me. It was to create a safe space to have a conversation, which some of us probably take for granted, but is not the reality in a lot of workplaces. So the law would 
provide the right to request a flexible or predictable working arrangement to assist with caregiving responsibilities for a child or children for whom the employee has parental responsibility or a person with a serious health condition in a family relationship with the employee. The law defines a serious health condition to mean an illness, injury, impairment, or physical or mental condition that involves either of the following. Inpatient care in a hospital, hospice, or residential health care facility, or continuing treatment or continuing supervision by a health care provider. And a family relationship is defined also uh, as another person who is a spouse, domestic partner, child, parent, sibling, grandchild, or grandparent. The employee's request may include, but is not limited to, a request for changes in the number of hours worked. For instance, employee might ask for part-time work. Um, the, a change in the time worked. For instance, a change in the start time or the quitting time. A change in the work location. The employee may ask to work from home or telecommute. A change in work assignment perhaps like a job sharing plan, or the predictability of the work schedule, which could be, in the industry I come from, um, how much notice um, needs to be given for overtime that's being requested. The employee's request must be in writing it must specify the change requested, the effective date and duration, and explain how it's related to caregiving. If the employee's initial request is verbal, the employer must instruct the employee to prepare a written request. After receiving a request, the employer is required to meet with the employee within 21 days is required to consider the request and respond within 21 days of the meeting, and the employer may grant or deny the request. If the employer grants the request, the employer must confirm the arrangement in writing, and the employer or the employee can revoke the arrangement with 14 days' notice. If the employer revokes the agreement, the employee may request a new, flexible, or predictable work arrangement. Um, an employee can make up to two requests per year. If the employer denies the request, the employer is required to explain the denial in writing and provide a bona fide business reason for the denial. We'll go into that a little more. The employer is also required to notify the employee of the right to request reconsideration. And if an employee requests reconsideration, the employer must meet with the employee again and issue a final decision. Bonafide reasons for denying a request for a flexible or predictable working arrangement may include, but are not limited to the following an identifiable cost, such as uh, loss of productivity, the cost of retraining or rehiring, the cost of transferring employees, a detrimental impact on the ability to meet customer or client demand, an inability to organize work among other employees, or insufficient work during the proposed schedule. This chart reviews what the request process looks like. An employee makes a written request. The employer within 21 days meets with the employee to discuss their proposal. 
The employer responds in writing within 21 days of the meeting. And then the employer either grants the request or denies the request. If the employer denies the request, the employee may request reconsideration. And within 21 days, there would be a second meeting. And within 21 days of that meeting, there would be a final decision. The ordinance prohibits employers from taking adverse employment action against any person on the basis of caregiver status or in retaliation for exercising rights protected under the ordinance. Those rights include the right to request a flexible or predictable working arrangement, the right to request reconsideration, the right to file a complaint with the OLSE, the right to inform any person about an employer's alleged violation of the chapter of the ordinance, the right to cooperate with the OLSE or other persons who are investigating or prosecuting any alleged violation, the right to oppose any policy practice or act that is unlawful under this ordinance, or the right to inform any person of his or her rights under the ordinance. Employers are also required to post a notice in a conspicuous place at all workplaces and job sites in English, Spanish, Chinese, and any language spoken by at least 5% of the employees. Um, as OLSE does with our other notices on minimum wage, paid sick leave, and health care, we'll be producing those notices and mailing them out. They'll also be available on our website. It, it's a um, two-sided legal size notice that needs to be posted. Uh, we'll be mailing it at the end of this year, I imagine, along with the health care security ordinance which also covers employers with 20 or more employees. Employers are also required to maintain records about requests for flexible or predictable work arrangements for three years from the date of an employee's request and allow OLSE access to those records to monitor compliance should we need to. There's no reporting requirement to the city other than maintaining those records. A collective bargaining agreement can waive any or all the provisions of the ordinance, uh, but in order to do so, the provisions of the ordinance that are being waived must be expressly provided for in the collective bargaining agreement in clear and unambiguous terms. In addition, the OLSE may exempt certain employees working in public safety and public health functions if an employer requests an exemption. The OLSE is the city agency that is authorized to enforce the law, but the OLSE review is limited to the employer's adherence to procedural posting and record keeping requirements. We won't be um, evaluating whether or not an employer had a bona fide business reason to deny a request. We're also authorized to review the validity of any claim of adverse employment action or retaliation based on exercising rights under the ordinance or based on caregiver status. In the first year of our enforcement, OLSE will be issuing warnings and notices to correct. After the first year, if OLSE determines that a violation has occurred, it may order any appropriate relief, including penalties of up to $50 per worker per day to the employee. That's per day that the violation continued, and up to $50 per worker per day to compensate the city for enforcement costs. The city also has a right to bring a civil action in court. And an employer may respond to any notice of violation and file an appeal to an independent hearing officer similar to our other local labor laws. 
It will be our goal in the coming year to focus on educating employers and employees about their obligations and their rights under the ordinance and to make the right to request meaningful in workers' lives. In the same way that San Francisco's paid sick leave ordinance has served as a model throughout the country uh, after San Francisco was the first jurisdiction to implement a paid sick leave law, we hope to serve as a successful enforcement model of flexible family workplace policies and to help achieve the important goals of this legislation. And thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions later in the presentation. Our next expert on the panel, Anna Victoria Fortes, served as, uh, serves as program analyst for Region 9 Women's Bureau Office. And in this position, she plans and develops programs to serve the needs of working women. As Amy mentioned, I work for the U.S. Department of Labor Women's Bureau, um, and our work is focused on empowering women to achieve economic security through a variety of programs. One of our priorities involves promoting work-life balance, and this includes promoting workplace uh, promoting flexible workplace policies. And one of the events that our agency organized to achieve this goal uh, was the National Dialogue on Workplace Flexibility, which was held in 10 different cities all throughout the US. And it focused on varying industries. And the goal of this forum was to bring together various stakeholders to raise awareness on the needs uh, for the need for workplace flexibility, exchange best practices, hear stories from stakeholders, and learn about the newest research on workplace flexibility. And we've also commissioned a, um, a handbook. It's called Flex Options. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about various workplace flexibility arrangements, um, you can speak to me after and I can hand you a copy. In these dialogues, uh, the Women's Bureau compiled a number of best practices, and these are tips that employers expressed were highly valuable to rolling out a successful workplace flexibility program. The first is to the first recommendation is to start small. Um, pilot programs are recommended for proposed working arrangements. Uh, this gives managers the opportunity to identify some challenges employees may have with regards to a particular work arrangement, and this also allows for greater control over the process. The second recommendation is to assess both management and employee perspectives, asking a series of questions that help employees describe the proposed work arrangement and how it will be accomplished, or how it will accomplish business um, objectives is really helpful to do. Um, it's important to take the time as a manager to confront your insecurities with flexible work arrangements um, and acknowledge what your bottom line is. And it could be that this work arrangement would actually improve your bottom line as well. Another recommendation is that communication is critical. Um, establishing clear ground rules on how to implement workplace flexibility and evaluate work performance is necessary to ensure that the work arrangement is actually working and meeting business needs. Um, it's important to have measurable results to establish this arrangement. Support for flexibility begins at the top. I know we've heard time and time again that you need management buy-in in order for something to, in order for a policy to become successful. Um, and it's like any business strategy that it requires this kind of buy-in. And when management actually practice this flexibility, employees are um, less reluctant to proposing a flexible work arrangement. And this also strengthens the culture of flexibility in your workplace. Another concept that, um, that we learned from these dialogues is that teams can actually help design flexibility. Asking team members, um, asking the team or group of employees that directly work with the uh, employee who's proposing the flexible work arrangement, they could actually help develop some strategies for completing the work. Um, and this could result in some really creative approaches to, to completing work that's assigned. We also encourage that you utilize toolkits and resource guides to guide this process. There's a number of um, advocacy organizations that have um, produced toolkits and um, you know, fact sheets and checklists and things like that. So that's something that I'll present after um, that would be valuable to your organization. 
And now I want to talk about some manager tips on reviewing proposals. The first is to be open, um, open to discuss the request for additional flexibility and consider alternatives, um, not just the one that the employee is proposing. Um, if the initial request doesn't work for some, if it doesn't meet business needs for any reason, um, it's important to discuss the discuss what kind of modi modifications can be done to res um, that might result as an acceptable solution. Uh, you'll also want to keep in mind the impact of the work arrangement on those who the employee works directly with or closely with, like team members, customers, or clients. Um, this is also a good time to establish the means of communication and how the employee will be able to meet their goals. Um, and also, you know, after you've considered that kind of impact, involve the team members in this process of um, evaluating what kind of work arrangement may work as you know, they could offer some really innovative ways and, and provide some valuable feedback um, during this review process and propose you know, a new method of flexibility. And as an employer who's invested in the success of his or her employee, it's important to think ahead about how this work arrangement will affect um, long-term and short-term goals. And lastly, this is the opportunity for the manager to uh, directly address any performance issues before considering um, a flexible work arrangement. In addition to reviewing the proposal, it's imperative to work with the employee to define the job expectations um, resulting from a flexible work arrangement. There are likely instances where um, there could be a work requirement that just can't be changed due to the nature of the job, um, you know, staff availability, maybe the volume, just to name a few considerations. Um, an example of this may be um, required, you know, required coverage during certain peak hours where employees need to, where more employees need to be on staff. Um, you know, for example, if you're in customer service and there are high volumes during a certain day of the week. Um, this could be a challenge when an employee is proposing a flexible work arrangement. Um, as an employer, you'll need to discuss what kind of work arrangement will work to meet customer demands. And the next point suggests um, that work groups may face unique challenges if an employee is working under a new work arrangement. Some things to consider would be defining core business hours, you know, when an employee is supposed to work so that it aligns with their, their teammates. And also what kind of technology may be used if, if, for example, they're working, if they're telecommuting. And you'll also want to establish some measurable goals and objectives. Um, some other ideas to include are, you know, what kind of outputs are being done while they're under a, a flexible work arrangement, what's the time frame of when a specific project should be completed, et cetera. And lastly, be specific with employees regarding how to handle certain business requirements, um, just to avoid some misunderstandings. Um, an example with this, of this would be how an employee um, will be attending a meeting. Will they be you know, communicating over the internet, um, or will they be in person? Will they have to come into the office that day? Um, also, what kind of communications needed to ensure work continues undisrupted? Um, things like business travel and what that would look like when an employee is working under a different work arrangement, face-to-face um, -face customer and client interaction, and also just the availability during specific hours. In closing, um, I hope that you've taken, a f taken away a few tips on how to successfully approach a flexible work arrangement proposal. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about workplace flexibility, I've compiled a few slides um, with some resources. So most of these are toolkits that offer kind of like a blueprint on how to blueprint and provide guidance on how to ask for a flexible work arrangement, and um, California-specific resources, and also some research if you're interested. Thank you. I've grouped questions, so I'll ask our panelists to be as specific and as brief as possible so we can get through as many questions. How does this new ordinance interact with the ADA requirements for reasonable accommodation as well as the Family Medical Leave Act? Can you introduce yourself because there is someone in the audience that can address that? Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Julia Parrish. I'm a lawyer at the Legal Aid Society Employment Law Center. Uh, so just briefly, um, FAMLA and CIFRA are two laws that provide 
people, um, eligible workers, the right to take time off from work, but it's it's usually um, has to do with leaves of absence only. So that's different from this ordinance in that it can be things other than a leave of absence. So other kinds of schedule changes or any kind of flexibility that really the worker and employer can think of that wouldn't really be part of the FMLA. Also the eligibility requirements are different. Um, so under the Family Family Workplace Ordinance, um, there are more people that you can take time off to care for, um, more people, and there's a lower employee threshold requirement and a lower um, length of service requirement and hours requirement than under the FMLA or CIFRA. Um, also, the ADA in the California version of that law, the FIHA, do allow for reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities, but that has to do with your own disability as opposed to helping care for somebody else who may be ill or disabled or need your help in some way. And um, one of the most important differences is that this ordinance provides the right to request those things and talk about options um, with your employer and employee and explore the different flexible options, which is a slightly different stance than the ADA and the FMLA, which are more, um, more entitlements. And if Thank you have you. questions afterwards, you can come. Donna, you mentioned this, but I just reiterate, is there a particular form that will be provided for employee requests and the employer to accept or deny? And when will that be available? Uh, OLSC plans to create a template that employees and employers can use, and it will be on our website. And I hope it will be up within 30 days. Uh, does the family-friendly workplace ordinance apply to the airport and Treasure Island? The airport, no. Treasure Island, yes. And how does it impact state employees? Okay. It, it, the law applies to work performed within the geographical boundaries of San Francisco. The airport's in San Mateo County. Treasure Island is in San Francisco. Um, and the law does not apply to other government agencies other than the city and county of San Francisco. We can't legislate um, local labor laws that affect other government agencies. Okay. Um, in the actual ordinance, there's a reference to 21 days. Does that refer to calendar days or business days? 21 days, if it does in, in this law, it doesn't mention business days, so that means that it's calendar days. Um, will OLSE be issuing any implementation rules in the near future? Yes, as I mentioned earlier, we do intend to um, take some of the most frequently asked questions um, and uh, provisions of the ordinance that need further guidance through a public rulemaking process. If, um, and this is a general question, if there are no reporting requirement requirements, as Donna mentioned, to the city, how will compliance be enforced? We will enforce, uh, initially, um, we will in take enforcement action based on complaints, which is similar to how we enforce um, a number of our city labor laws, like minimum wage and paid sick leave. And you mentioned this earlier, but just to reiterate, a, a notice um, will be provided uh, to, for employers to post. If so, when? And will it be pro provided in multiple languages? The notice will be provided. It will be mailed out. Um, the mailing usually goes out um, towards the end of December. Mm -hmm. So the, this workplace ordinance, as far as I remember, does not require employers to break a collective bargaining agreement. So can you just reiterate what that is about? Uh, the parties to a collective bargaining agreement can explicitly provide a waiver in their collective bargaining agreement um, that would exempt them from any or all the provisions of the ordinance. As I understand the ordinance and the collective bargaining agreement waiver, that's different. I mean, if, if union-represented employers already have collective bargaining agreements in place, there's not going to be a waiver because this ordinance was just enacted. But there still remains the issue if a collective bargaining agreement 
contains collectively bargained terms like seniority is done by scheduling is done by seniority for example and somebody with almost no seniority comes in and says I want this fantastic schedule and I'm making this request under this San Francisco ordinance so give me this fantastic schedule well if they don't have the seniority for that fantastic schedule are you saying employers in a union represented environment have to violate their collective bargaining agreements or the collectively bargained rights of others in the name of this ordinance? Okay, thanks for the question. The city is not saying that any employer has to violate a collective bargaining agreement. In the situation that you laid out, I would think the parties to that collective bargaining agreement would likely have a discussion about um, drafting, uh, waiving any or all of the provisions that might be in conflict with the seniority provisions or not. But I, I would expect that the parties to that collective bargaining agreement would have a discussion about that. Well, it's a follow-up uh, question that I have here, um, and it's regarding a 24-7 operation. Is it a valid reason for an employer to deny flexible work requests if allowing an employee if it meant that allowing an employee to leave early would require another employee to come in earlier to close, to cover, to cover the work? Uh, I would review the suggested, um, the examples of bona fide business reasons. I think that probably fits into one. Mm -hmm. Okay, can employers designate a central manager that must be contacted to initiate the flexible workplace request? Uh, and this particular writer of this card says, we're a large organization with multiple locations and managers, and so that might work in this particular uh, company. Will that, is that's, that allowed? That's not addressed specifically in the ordinance. I think that's reasonable. Okay. Um, generally, it's a brand new ordinance. It doesn't even go into effect until two months from now. Um, so... You know, in terms of the time frame of clarifying some of this, what, what typically happens when there's a new ordinance? What's the time frame? You know, talk, talk us through that because there are some things that aren't totally clear. Um, so our office has established a dedicated email um, and a dedicated uh, phone line for questions about the ordinance. We'll be responding to every inquiry that comes in and those questions that are most frequently asked will be listed on a frequently asked questions page. Those questions that we feel um, are thorny or uh, could use more public discussion will refer to a rulemaking process. And what that looks like is we would issue a list of questions and our proposed regulation and we would take public input uh, at a public hearing on those questions um, to inform what would be a final regulation that we would issue. And there is a question here about when that hearing would take place. To be determined. Okay, and then it may be a quarter or two sometime in the next year. Definitely. Okay. All right, so regarding the mandate to post the uh, family-friendly work ordinance, would posting on an online... <clears throat> Would posting on an online forum be sufficient, or does the ordinance actually need to be posted in the physical office? The notice needs to be posted mm -hmm. someplace where workers can see it. If there is no physical office and it's a virtual workplace, then I would think it could be done some way electronically. Mm -hmm. Basically, if an employer has an existing telecommuting pro policy, they have a request process, um, they have a, a process to review that. Do you agree that the employer can demand that the em employee follow that process and that just asking may I telecommute is not sufficient and an employer uh, may respond with follow the process, the existing process, um, and not be deemed in violation of the ordinance? Okay, so in general what the law provides is a minimum that employers have to follow. If employers already have um, workplace policies regarding requesting um, flexible workplaces that are 
more robust, that's fine, but they have to at least follow the city policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this next question from the audience is really around employers that have employees that work in multiple locations, some in San Francisco and some outside. The ordinance applies to uh, San Francisco-based em employees, but what happens if an employer is based outside of San Francisco, like San Bruno, and some of the employees spend most or all their time working in San Francisco? How do employers proceed? Where the employer is based is not relevant here. It's where the work is performed. So if they're in San Francisco, the ordinance applies? Correct. If the work is performed in San Francisco, I'm going to say, or the majority of the work is performed in San Francisco, and that's the kind of thing that we could clarify, but I would say that that would be an employee who's covered by the ordinance. Yeah. It, Julia, where are you? Do you have an answer for that? Oh, I can ask you any time, right? Bam, if we have a legal thing, I can throw it to you? Okay, I'm just... All right, I'm just reading cards here. We're reading cards. All right, stay, you know, just stay on deck. Here we go. Um, one of the requests um, that an employee can make is a request to work at another location. Is this an employer requirement to entertain this request if the location is the employer's office in another geographical location, like the Oakland office? They're in San Francisco. They're requesting to work in Oakland. Maybe it's closer to their kids or their home. Sure, if the employee is covered by the ordinance, then their request is a request that needs to be considered. Okay. All right. Um, more questions. And this one is a similar, but I'm just to reiterate. This is coming from a lot of places. If a worker in San Francisco um, lives somewhere like Burlingame, how does this ordinance solve or address the issues of family in San Francisco? This is a policy question. This is not for you. Um, the family left San Francisco for Burlingame long ago. Okay, they're making a statement. Statement made. Good job. All right. If a non-exempt employer, uh, non-exempt employee works 12 hours a day, does the employer apply the California wage hour law? Yes, an hourly employee who works more than eight hours a day is entitled to overtime. Even if it's a flexible arrangement, I want to work a certain number of 12-hour days so that I don't have to come in every day kind of thing. There's a provision in the labor code that um, provides for alternative work weeks. I think it involves an election at the workplace. I would suggest that... Um, that that whoever is the ask her the question consult and review those provisions. Okay. Um, are nonprofits exempt? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like one word answers. Okay. Um, this one's for Ju Julia. How does a request for a flexible schedule tie in with alternative schedule adoption procedures? And first, tell us what that is. I think this is just what. Um um, Dot and I was talking about. So there, you still have to comply with wage and hour obligations uh, under the state law, and there are in the in the labor code ways to elect for alternate work days that are separate than this ordinance um, and involve an, a, a workplace as a whole, as opposed to an individual. Um, but it's a separate process that's outlined in the state labor code. Uh, but for the purposes of the family family workplace ordinance, you still have to um, pay wages and overtime. Mm -hmm. And just to follow up uh, with that, employees may request to work any hour or any day of the week under the ordinance? Yes. The employ employers are not required to grant that, right? Because they, get, they, get, they have business reasons that they can cite that that's not appropriate. Okay. All right, if the employee works from home, uh, do the, do the, does the employer have to provide uh, the technology necessary to work from home or the employee, you know, in other words, should the employer bear the cost and responsibility of providing telecommuting equipment under this ordinance? This is not something that's addressed in the ordinance. So the answer is the ordinance doesn't require it. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, this one is about a particular uh, um, set of employers. How does the law affect those working in education? I'm assuming 
everything from K to 12 to um, university level. Is there a specific, um, how, how does the law affect, or is it any different? Um, public schools, I, uh, SFUSD, I don't, I don't believe would be covered by the ordinance. Private schools would, private employers would. But for the same reasons that we can't impose this on another government body, SFUSD would be one. So which government, so the state, it applies for state employees. It does not imply, apply for state employees. It does not. And federal employees, it does not apply. It does not. Even if they work in San Francisco. Correct. Okay, so what are the other, the, and the, any other agencies, including the school districts? And Okay. Um, if, um, so it wouldn't yeah. apply at, uh, to employees who, state employees who work at San Francisco State, but it would impl apply to employees at USF. And is there any particular class of employees with those state agencies it might apply to, or it's across the board? Employees who work for the state. Okay. Would not be covered. That's clear, right? Okay. If workers are covered by a CBA, does the CBA have to specifically waive the family-friendly workplace ordinance requirements, or can other clauses, general clauses, work uh, with the ordinance? No. The CB in, or in order to waive any provisions of the FFWO in a CBA, it has to be explicitly waived. Okay. How do you evaluate the outcome? Is that part of the legislation? If, if there is no, re, no report to the board regarding implementation or outcomes that's required. However, based on our experience with other laws, I imagine there will be organizations who are doing some analysis and studies um, that will be publicly available. Okay. Um, we are almost finished. Any burning questions out there while we got a roving mic? Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm Jennifer Reich. I'm uh, with Equal Rights Advocates. Um, and I just had a question for Donna. Um, the one question I had about the scope of the OLSC's enforcement or investigative authority is whether or not um, you will have any authority to investigate whether the employer has followed uh, its obligations with respect to notice. Um, I know that you, you mentioned that your, your review um, of complaints will be limited to certain procedural things, and I wondered whether um, an, an employer's compliance or failure to comply with the notice requirements, such as giving the employee notice that their request must be made in writing, giving their employee notice that they have a right to request rec reconsideration, is, is within your, your agency's bailiwick. I believe that giving an employee notice that, for instance, um, they can re have the right to request reconsideration is something that we would look at. The procedures are certainly within our authority to review. Um, Similarly, whether the employer posted the, the required notice would be within our review. It's a good question, and we will carefully review the ordinance um, and try to provide that, the answer, in our frequently asked questions. Thank you. All right, our second of th three questions could be right here. Hi, good morning. My name is Syrah. I'm a labor and employment attorney practicing here in the city. And I just had a question going back to the um, concept of covered employer. Because the law is taking effect in two months and, you know, employers are asking whether or not they're covered. I just wanted to, I have sort of a specific question regarding the way I read the ordinance and wanted to get your thoughts on it. But both employer and employee are defined terms within the ordinance and employer um, is defined with 20 or more employees, and then employees is a defined term, and that encompasses those who work within the city. So my reading of the ordinance was clear in that a covered employer would be somebody with 20 or more 
persons who work within the city. Um, and I know earlier in the talk you mentioned that that was ambiguous and would be subject to additional clarification, but given that this is coming up in two months, I wanted to see if you know that was sort of a reasonable way to read the ordinance, because I thought it was, it was somewhat clear based on the definitions provided. Thank you. I think it was the goal of the crafters of the ordinance to use a definition of covered employer that was similar to the healthcare security ordinance, which would be um, 20 or more employees who worked anywhere. Um, I think you raise a good point about how it's written and we'll certainly look into it and try to provide guidance ASAP. Yeah, thank you though, that, that's helpful. All right, our final question, this gentleman right here. All right, I wanna thank you all for your questions, even those who scribbled them down. I did my best to try to uh, convey, and I wanna thank our, uh, our panelists, Donna Levitt, Anna Fortes, Ann Lehman. Thank you all for your expertise, thank you so much. I want to thank uh, I want to thank uh, President uh, David Chu, who I think has already vacated the building, and the and my colleagues at the Department on the Status of Women, and above all, thank you all as we work together to clarify the rules around the family friendly ordinance. Have an awesome day.